Today we have a tremendous opportunity to talk to someone very high at the California state political level. And we are really thankful that he has time to come on and join us and have this conversation. I'm talking about Senator John Morlock. He will be joining us here in a moment. Welcome to Open for Business. My name is Steve Smith. I'm your host. I'm also president of Growth Sorts Coaching, which is a local business coaching company here in Lake Forest. These daily broadcasts are hosted by um, the Lake Forest Chamber of Commerce and Spectrum Specialty and Awards, and we're also in partnership with the San Juan Chamber of Commerce. So we're very glad to have those folks on supporting us. If this is your first time watching this broadcast, uh, we invite you to tag us and share us and, uh, and, and keep, the, keep the conversation going. Uh, you can also go to the video section and look at any number of, of uh, broadcasts we've had over the past five weeks with a lot of really good business information that I believe is evergreen will help you going forward. So let's get to our guest. Uh, Senator Morlock uh, is an incredible influencer here in California state politics. He is also a great friend to the business community. Um, he is a great friend to the city of Lake Forest. We've had him uh, at uh, some local venues for a um, number of times over the past few years to speak to us personally. So I'm very, very happy to have him on. Let's bring him on now. I think he's booting up. We'll give him a we'll give him a minute to to appear here. While he's coming on, let me just give you an idea of who this gentleman is. He is a member of the California State Senate, representing the 37th Senate District, which includes most of Orange County. Uh, previously, he was on the board of supervisors for Orange County, and uh, between December or January 5th of 2015 and December of 2006, or the reverse, that's when he did his uh, board of supervisors. But he really got his notoriety as the treasurer and tax collector back in the mid 90s when uh, uh, Orange County was going through its bankruptcy. And he actually was the one that kind of saw this happening and was very instrumental in being able to, um, uh, uh, to, to turn it around. Um, so we didn't suffer any, any long term problems with that. John, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, Steve. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, you're coming in great. Uh, no picture. But we can hear you. Oh, you know what? You know what? I have been covering up my uh, camera <laughs> deal. Sorry. Hey, that's Sorry. quite all right. Look, when we started this five weeks ago, we were like babes in the woods. We were making all kind of mistakes. So we, yeah. we thankfully we flushed out all those little bugs. I don't like where the camera is on my laptop, but uh, I, I am wearing my San Juan Capistrano shirt. There for, you go. For your guests. I'm I'm sure they're loving every minute of that. So I listen, see thanks, for, thanks for being on today. I know your calendar is probably just bursting at the seams, but we're very happy to be able to talk to you, especially about what's going on in the business community right now. And I know that you provided us with some, some great subjects, which we definitely want to get into. But to start this conversation off, can you, can you kind of give us an idea of how the business community is going to move forward in this with everything that California is doing at, at the Sacramento level? It's a great question. Uh, I guess what's left of the business community, you're saying? Um, it's it it's it's been amazing, Steve. That although I haven't had to fly to Sacramento for the last five weeks, um, I've been here at the office, and the phone calls have been painful uh, mm -hmm. to listen to business owners who are exasperated, wondering when their cash will run out. Uh, so especially restaurants, uh, a lot of a lot of discussions with the restaurant owners has been very difficult. Uh, within the first few days, the restaurant across the street from my district office had to terminate 60 employees, mm -hmm. hourly, hourly employees. And some of them have been with the restaurant for over 20 years. And it was painful. So um, <clears throat> it's, it's real interesting, you know, what is essential and what is not essential? And, you know, what is good behavior and practice uh, that, you know, we could do to still keep our businesses open. Uh, and so that's, I guess, an, another discussion, but uh, it's gonna be, I would say, I would say this is gonna be a recession that will probably be the mother of all recessions. You know, we've gone through the early nineties, we've gone through the great recession of the 2000s, uh, but I, I see this one as being probably 
tougher. We, we, the, the unemployment numbers are staggering. We've got over three and a half million people that have already filed for unemployment benefits in California. That is a number that is greater than the population of Orange County. And we, um, we have like 3.2 million people and we're about 11% of the state's population. So when three and a half million people file for unemployment claims in just six weeks, that number is greater than what happened through the entire 59 weeks of the Great Recession. This has come on like a massive heart attack. It's just been uh, just amazing. The state has already paid out uh, $4 billion in, in unemployment uh, benefits, uh, just $1 billion since a week ago Sunday. And that's just uh, the state. That's not the federal, right? It's the state. Wow. And the state will probably spend enough money that it will have to borrow from the federal government to pay unemployment benefits. That happened in the Great Recession, and business owners had to pay a higher FUTA tax every year, the federal unemployment tax, uh, for uh, up until just a year or two ago. Uh, and, and, and so now we're back to 0. 0.7 for the business owners of, of, of payroll uh, for like the first 7,000 in wages. But, but now it, it, you can expect that to, to jack up again because the state won't be able to pay back the feds fast enough. And so that'll be laid on the, on the business owners, which is what Jerry Brown did. Right. Ooh. So this is not going to be pleasant. I, 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 my, in my opinion, you know, I, I would, I would love to see a V, you know, quick down, quick up, but I, I don't see that. I, you know, we've been through this. I'm old now. I've, I've been through a few of these and, and I, I'm not liking what I see. And, and, and it, it's been heartrending and heartbreaking. Well, look, it's no secret, at least amongst people in this state that have businesses, that the state government is not our friend in a lot of cases, all right? They, they do things over time that I think they, they think are good and right, but it, it ends up falling on the business owner's plate. Um, what do you see that they either could be doing or should be doing maybe over the next 30 to 45 days to kind of ease this gradual closing of businesses that just can't hold on any longer? or possibly helping them to get back into it a little faster? Because, you know, there's news nationally of all kinds of other states trying things. And of course, some of them are getting applauded. Their other ones are getting beat up. And we have our own situations here in Southern California where over the weekend, you know, beaches were open and people were enjoying themselves, but it didn't seem to appease the folks up in Sacramento. So what should they be doing to help as opposed to kind of feeling like they're just pressing us down a little further? Yeah, lots of lots to unpack uh, in, in that, that question. Uh, I did an editorial submission for the business journal, the Orange County Business Journal last week. I said, okay, Governor, let's get us back to work. Um, we've been looking at the numbers every day coming out of Orange County from the healthcare agency. Uh, we, we've been watching the numbers stay pretty consistent and declining, but uh, on the week, over the weekend, it popped up again. Now, the last two days going down again. Uh, so new cases kind of, you know, we're waiting for terms like spike and surge and peak. Um, and, and we haven't quite seen that. So our hospitals have been anticipating uh, a big influx. But if you look at the county's website, and I put it out every day in my daily blog posting, uh, we've been in the same range. People in ICU has just been maybe 60 in the whole county yes. On yes. every day uh, for this whole period, <clears throat> which means that we haven't seen this massive you know requests for people to come in uh, to put be put on ventilators we just haven't seen it in orange county and and so we probably haven't you know the numbers are different in la numbers are different in new york city but orange county has been doing real well as to beaches uh, i just talked to a city council member from from newport beach you know but it was the news for the weekend right everybody's showing up because very few beaches are open nothing in la Maybe right. some in Ventura right. County. Uh, so people are getting, you know, cabin fever, uh, but they want fresh air. They want to get out. But if you look at the data, uh, the, the number of people that have had COVID-19 or have contracted coronavirus is higher per capita in San Clemente, Laguna Beach, Newport Beach. So I, I'm, I, I'm as, as a non-epidemiologist, I can't tell you that it's a good idea to go to the beach. Um, I don't know if it's the wind or, you know, so six feet isn't enough. Right. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but you want to be careful. There's a, there's a, there's a, obviously a greater risk uh, to yourself and to the people that live there who are now 
watching you, you know, climb all over their property basically to get to the beach. So, you know, there's just a, a lot going on. I, I, you know, we've got the model of Sweden all the way to, you know, just this massive clamp down in California. And there's got to be some balance. There has to be some balance. We've got to get people back to work. We've got to get the economy moving. Okay, so I know from reading a lot of your editorials in the register, um, you're clearly at the top of the list when it comes to holding the state accountable for, you know, their fiscal decisions and the impact of spending and, and where it goes and things of that nature. Um, do you think that being in this situation is going to cause them to go back and look at some laws that they've recently put into practice that that may, may need to be pushed aside in an effort to help the, the business community and the economy rebound? We, we did a lot of research. Uh, California has 944 school districts. Um, we grabbed all of their audited financial statements. Big project, did it for June 30, 17, because I knew on June 30, 18, the balance sheets by the certified public accountants, the independent auditors, would have to add other post-employment benefits. A lot of school districts like uh, LA Unified School District, just north of us, largest in the state, have given promises they can't keep. They've, they've said, well, well, we will pay our retirees lifetime medical benefits. Just, you know, an, ask, you know, just an astounding thing to even try and get your brain around. Right. But, but putting that on their balance sheet meant that they had to report $15 billion in more liabilities. $15 billion. Now, that district can't rub two nickels together per student, but that's more than 20,000 per student that they have to figure out how to pay for. And so we got to take a hard look at what our districts have done. Out of 944 combined, their unrestricted net deficit was $50 billion as of June 30, 17, and it jumped to 70 billion, a 40% increase just because of the retiree medical. And, and, our, and they were already suffering from massive pension debts that they, they have great benefits that you don't see in the private sector. You're gonna find one business owner in your membership that has the kind of pension system, to find benefit that, that the state and the district and the cities do. So <clears throat> this may be an opportunity. This may be an opportunity to say, okay, wait a second. You know, your unions were too successful. They got too much, it's unsustainable, and it's time to, to take care of it. I don't see that happening in Sacramento. I don't see the legislature making any constructive changes because the public employee unions have their boots on the necks of the Democrats there. I mean, it's been a, it's been a, a sight to behold. Well, the other, the other law that's been getting a lot of press in the paper is, is AB5. And, and I can't imagine with what's going on now that implementing that law is helping at all when you consider all the people in the state that are doing gig style work, maybe as a profession, maybe as a second income. Do you see any relief in that area or are they just going to keep plowing through to keep that one going? AB5, just to explain it, is, is, is a, a bill that resulted from a state Supreme Court case called Dynamex, where that company decided, you know, we could save a lot of Social Security tax, FICA, if we made everybody an independent contractor. Well, you don't do that. The IRS will come in and make sure that you pay for those that are common law employees, those that you tell them how to do it and where to do it and when to do it. Uh, whereas an independent contractor says, I will give you the results and you don't worry about how I, how I deliver it to you. I'll bill you for, for my time and, and, and worth. Uh, and so this uh, Supreme Court case was really embraced by uh, the, the, the outside unions and say, wait, boy, if we can make everybody an employee, then we can organize them and let's go after Lyft and Uber. And, you know, you know and, and so I guess the premise would be that if you want to be a taxi driver, you know, and do it full time, just paint your car yellow. I mean, you know, but if you, if not, if you just want to do it to earn a little bit of income in the evening and, and you want to take your, your family and kids on vacation with that little bit of income, you're an independent contractor and, and you're just doing it on your time. You're delivering the final result. Yes. They're not telling you what to drive, how to drive. So um, 
this this was adopted. I gave four floor speeches against this bill last year, and it still passed. Only one Republican voted for it, and, and he paid the price. He did not win his primary uh, last month. Uh, anyway, it uh, it was one of those interesting bills that we're saying to the governor, you're, you are in a recession. Let, you know, do an executive order, put aside AB5, because all these freelance workers in California are being terminated by companies around the, 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 the country, and, 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 and they're hiring freelance writers in other states, right. I mean, just because of AB5. So I've, I've approached the administration two times now saying, what are you going to do about AB5? And they said, we're not touching any labor bills. I mean, they're, they're, they're still in denial. So I have um, submitted SB 990, which says that we should put a two-year suspension on implementing AB 5. Let the economy and everything settle down. Let's look at what is really, you know, a common law employee and what's really uh, uh, an independent contractor. And let's not just carve out certain industries. You know, it's bad law when you carve out travel well, agents. And there's there's dozens of industries they've already carved out. Yes. Yeah. But, but you shouldn't be vertical. It should be horizontal. Everybody should play by the same rules. Right. Should be clear. And the IRS has been very clear for decades on, because they, they want to make sure you're, you're treating people properly because they get the FICA, right? They need to pay for Social Security benefits. Hmm. Well, all right. So I'm, I'm going to throw a hypothesis out here just for discussion purposes. Let's say that come June 1, California is open for business, you know, with probably some prudent restrictions, you know, distancing, gloves, things of that nature. But if that's the case, how do you see the business community being able to get back to some sense of normalcy? What is it going to take? What What is the state going to have to do or not do? Maybe what's on your personal agenda in, in the role that you have to kind of help facilitate that? So I'll put on my crystal ball and, and try try to see, but uh, I see. I see it as a slow ramp up. Um, we're already seeing the devastating effects of what happens when you close Disneyland. The resort is is down. Is is shut down. Excuse me. The hotels aren't doing any business, and then you don't have the tourism. Uh, who knows how quickly that comes back? But right now, Anaheim is losing a million dollars a day, probably in revenues. Uh, so it's going to have a fiscal crater that's going to be massive. Anaheim is already a, what we call a legacy city. It's been around a long time, but it's in the bottom of the 34 cities when you look at their financial statements. They're they're not in good shape. Um, yeah, they've been really dependent on Disney for half their revenues, but now it's a mistake, right? Not diversified enough. So you may see a city like Anaheim or a city like Costa Mesa, which is actually 34th out of 34 cities. And it has South Coast Plaza, one of the highest grossing shopping opportunities in the nation, sitting closed for a month. So you can imagine what kind of sales tax revenues that Costa Mesa is not receiving, but they will be candidates for bankruptcy. And they will probably have to go to chapter nine, which is what Orange County did 25 years ago, and try to do a plan of adjustment that maybe fixes pensions, maybe fixes retiree medical, maybe fixes other uh, issues, but you know, going forward. But while you're in bankruptcy, that's not going to bode well for those businesses in those cities. It's going to be hard to attract new businesses, right. you know, track things. So there's a, there's a stigma. There's, there's all that. I've been there, done that, uh, but it's survivable. You know, no one would go outside and look around and say, Oh, you mean Orange County filed for bankruptcy? They would, wouldn't, you know, young kids that were born after 94, they, they look in shock when you say that the county had been in a bankruptcy court. Right. So get through it, but it's going to be a, I, I believe, Steve, it's going to be a slow, steady climb. And that's why everybody now really has to nurse their reserves and, and do their best to hang on. Uh, given this big financial crater that you've been speaking about at the state level, I mean, at some point, how do you think they're going to recoup that? Are we potentially looking at other little taxes and fees and things they tend to kind of sneak into the into the environment without anybody noticing or are they just going to come out and assess everybody something to try to you know try to work their way back well um 
in November of 18, we saw I think five cities in Orange County with sales tax measures on their November ballots. Uh, I would think that uh, those cities that haven't already maxed out on the potential sales tax they're allowed to assess uh, will will be uh, putting those on on the ballot. You have to approve a tax increase like that, uh, but that's probably the the wrong approach to take. There, there should be some incentives to help businesses get back uh, in 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 better shape, and 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 charging a higher sales tax may not be. The answer, but that is usually the response that government pursues. You probably hear Governor Newsom say, you know, we need a temporary income tax increase. Well, that's what Jerry Brown did, right? And in Prop 30, and then they renewed it, I think, in Prop right. 55. Well, there's no such thing as a temporary tax. And yet California, we have the highest income tax, 13.3%. We have the highest gas tax, we have the highest already sales tax. And with Prop 13 over enough time, we're getting pretty close to having the highest property tax. There's not much room for us to go. And in California, what makes it even more difficult is with the uh, new jobs and, and tax cuts bill out of the federal government a couple years ago, you can only deduct $10,000 of state and local taxes. So I've had one very successful Newport Beach businessman say to me, John, I'm not paying 13.3%. I'm paying 23% marginal tax rate because I don't get to deduct my taxes on my federal return. So why am I paying you one out of every $4 that I earn? Why would I do that? And I couldn't really give him a good answer, Steve. <laughs> he says, well, fine, then I'm going to close escrow on a mansion in, in Miami for $10 million and I'll see you later. There's no state income tax there. Wow. So the harder and the heavier you put it on the 1% of our population that pays 50% of the personal income tax, you're asking for some real problems because they're mobile. They can move to Incline Village and Nevada yes. or you name it. And so it's going to be a tough balancing act. You know, how, how many feathers can you pull off a bird before it stops flying? Well, the other thing that I'm kind of nervous about, although it seems like it's had some pretty good pushback is this whole split role concept that they're trying to, they're trying to basically take apart Prop 13 and leave the residents intact, but go after the business property. And to me, that, that would be a massive blow right now. So I don't know, do you think the situation we're in might actually be a good thing for not having that become law? Or do you think they'll look at that as easy money and do it anyway? Well, they, they did it um, because they needed more revenue to fund the pension plan. <laughs> right. You know, they, they needed the unions needed something because they could see the problem and, and they could see what was happening to cities and school districts. And so that's the idea they came up with. You know, why are commercial property owners paying such a low amount on their tax? Because they've never moved. But yet the, the principal residents, you know, side of the equation, they're turning over all the time. And therefore, the assessed value has gone up with every every purchase and so it's the old uh, you know like like adults are just kids and adult bodies it's like the it's not fair <laughs> argument so why don't we make it you know have the, the businesses pay more but what they don't realize is the majority of commercial property is owned by small businesses and so they they would then take a hit which it gets passed along somehow or if you can't build it in your price then you're going to be cutting you know, employees, right? You're going to downsize of some sort. So it's going to be a big mistake. The psychology of it all uh, is it, a little hard to predict. Uh, it, we saw Prop 13, the new Prop 13 in March, go down to defeat a $15 billion bond measure. Usually they always pass. If it's for schools, you know, that's gold. They always pass. Yes. It yes. isn't. So the voters are at least saying, wait a second, enough is enough. How could you ask for a, a debt when you've got a $21 billion surplus. Well, that $21 billion surplus is really evaporated. There may be a strong argument where it gets emotional. You know, we need the money now. It's for our kids. It's for public safety. And, and we're going to have to say, wait a second, you screwed up. You didn't manage our money properly the first time. We're not going to be enablers. We can't just give you more money so you mess it up again and then you come back. You're always coming back for more money. Right. This is too much to pay for the weather. 
Well, given the severe imbalance up in Sacramento, you know, Dem Democrat versus Republican, do you guys have any influence at all that can stop these or, or put a little logic into them? Or are you just kind of sitting there watching it all happen because of the numbers? It depends. It depends on the bill. Uh, but right now there are uh, 29 Democrats in the Senate and 10 Republicans. We have a special election to fill a vacancy in the Riverside area. Hopefully we get a Republican that brings us to 11. We'll see what happens in November. I would love to see us get three seats. That would be great. That would get us to 14. And 14 is the magic number where if there are bills that require a two thirds vote, then Republicans can stop those bills. Right now they've had free reign, um, but uh, there are a few bills where, you know, some of the Democrats go, no, we don't like this. And so, you know, they try to get some of us to vote up on it, but uh, it doesn't, it doesn't always work. You still have to get, you know, do the, do the numbers, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a little difficult. I give floor speeches. I, you should, you should listen to my floor speech on, on the budget saying, I'm sure they're good. <laughs> get ready guys. You know, We've already got an inverted yield curve. We were already, we already knew a, a recession was coming. We just didn't know it would be, you know, expedited by the coronavirus. But but for 65 years, the inverted yield curve has been right. And so it's like you guys are spending way too much. You got to save more, you got to pay your pension down more. And 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 they just keep flying like everything's great. Because people think this way. People think, and you're a coach, so you know that people. They think yesterday is today is tomorrow. If the market's good yesterday and if it's good this year, it's going to be great tomorrow. And, and no, we're old enough. It goes up and down, not up, 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 up. And so we knew something was coming. And so, so maybe, the, again, just to answer the question, maybe the voters say, Tell, time out. And uh, we'll, so we'll see. But I, I'd say it's a coin flip. Wow. Well, listen, um, before we close out, is there anything else that you would like to say or make mention of that maybe didn't happen during the conversation here? Because while we've got you on here, we're just dying to get all of the wisdom you have to offer. Well, what's amazing, Steve, is, is how much we could talk about. It is uh, just amazing. Um, I, I can probably think of, of, of a lot of subjects uh, we also have other things, you know, on the fall uh, ballot, but but split roll is critical. The business community really has to step up. Had a conversation today um, with an insider who said that Donald Brin will be stepping up big time to oppose prop uh, this this split roll, but it, it keeps coming back every two years. Some kind of liberal crazy idea like rent control two years ago where. You know, the community up and down the state, the business owners had to put, you know, I think they raised $75 million to oppose Prop 10. Well, you can't be raising $75 million every two years, you know, for these crazy uh, kinds of, of bills or, or ballot measures. So it's, it's, it's a lot of wear and tear on the community, uh, in the business community, when they should really be changing the composition of the legislature to have more Republicans so that this silly stuff you know, it doesn't happen uh, as as often as, as it does. Uh, so um, we're, we're, we're trying to attack these things. We're trying to say, look, we got to free up the economy. We got to we got to put AB5. We got to suspend it. We got to look at what happens to all these pension plans. Uh, and maybe Chapter 9 might be a godsend where you step in and say, look, instead of a defined benefit pension plan, which is a Rolls Royce type of structure, which you guys abused along the way. You you improved the benefits formulas in 1990 from by, by, by going from 2% to 3% at 50. You know, when you increase a fully funded pension plan's liability by 50%, you're now two thirds funded. And we've been two thirds funded for 20 years now. And we have to come in and say, okay, wait, the unions don't like defined contribution plans, 401k type. So let's come in with a shared risk Plan, which is what the state of Wisconsin has been doing since 1982. And they just have realistic assumptions. Let's assume that we earn what a bond pays. Let's look at 4% returns instead of 8% or 7%, which these public pension plans do. Let's look at reasonable retirement ages. Why, why 50? And why do public employees retire at 57 when everybody else is retiring at 65? And why are we giving guaranteed COLAs, cost of living adjustments every year? And so 
Uh, Wisconsin says, hey, we're assuming 4%. You're retiring like a normal person at 65. And, and by the way, you get no COLAs unless the pension plan seems to produce a higher rate of return. And then we can share that. And if we don't get a higher rate of return, then you share. You, you, you pay a little more into the plan every year. And, and so that when you look at the Pew Charitable Trust reports every year, Wisconsin has been number one. 100% funded every year where California is 71% funded, Costa Mesa is 61% funded. I mean, something has to give, something has to change. So we might see this as a real opportunity. It won't be pretty, it'll be very painful. It'll take a lot of political will right. for a lot of council members because the pressure is just gonna be unbearable from their employees. And But, but something here has to give and something has to be improved so it's fair to taxpayers and it's fair to the employees. Well, Senator Morlock, thank you very much for being on today. We really appreciate your time and uh, we'd love to have you back at some point because you're right, I could talk to you all day about this stuff, but you know, the audience out there has a limit. <laughs> so uh, I, we do, we do. We really appreciate you coming on and oh, well, good luck you. with everything you're involved in and, and fighting the good fight up in Sacramento. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. And Take have care. A better, have a better week. Yes, I hope you too. Have a safe one. Bye-bye now. Bye.